Hello. Good morning, Minister. Thank you Hi. for being with us today. Thank you. It's a plug. Uh, if you're ready, I'm ready, actually. Yeah, yeah we can start. Oh, cool. Um, thank you again uh, to you personally and to Lithuania for being so supportive for Ukraine, to Ukraine in our struggle with Russia. And uh, in this respect, you personally, as head of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you strongly support us on our path to NATO. So uh, what, in your opinion, can be done and what maybe new formats could be applied to speed up the process? And how do you assess the latest statement by President Zelensky seeking accelerated procedure for Ukraine? Well, first of all, I'm not surprised that uh, President Zelensky made, made the statement. Uh, I think that many uh, have expected uh, Ukrainian officials, politicians, leaders to say something like that. Uh, <clears throat> Ukrainian army is already uh, being armed as NATO army, is being trained as NATO army. So it only remains a question when it will actually become uh, part, of, uh, part of NATO and country becomes part of uh, the alliance. So, um, so this question is is in the room. It's a big elephant <laughs> that is impossible not uh, not to notice. Uh, the first the first step, I think that it has to be uh, the decision has to be political, and it has to be you know it has to be decision has to be made in the politicians' offices, political offices. So the convincing needs to happen. We need to talk with our partners and try to uh, to, to to convince everybody who is not yet convinced that uh, uh, Ukraine's future is in NATO, uh, but also NATO's future is with Ukraine. I don't see it any other way. Well, uh, speaking of alliances, uh, this time regional and some local unions and initiatives are also important. Uh, we call the Lublin Triangle, the Lidpol Ukrubrik, uh, the Three Cs, um, and others. Uh, what kind of work is to be done within these formats or maybe some others to help Ukraine repel aggression? I'm not saying militarily, but maybe as a consultation format or something else. Well, <laughs> Lithuania is, is, you know, due to our regional um, constellation, we are a, a member of, of several uh, formats as well. Uh, you know, be Baltic, uh, Nordic Baltic, uh, Poland and Baltic, so and and Lublin Triangle, uh, we've seen through our experience when it comes to integration into EU or or NATO, the formats were very helpful in speeding up the reforms. We managed to share our experiences, uh, being uh, be offered advice and experiences by by others who uh, went through the accession. Uh, previously or were going with different experiences so i think it, it this this is um like a platform of uh of helping helping each other each other out so i think that in ukraine ukraine's case would be uh would be similar uh that means that uh the formats that you've mentioned would be those where you present the main issues that you're struggling with or you need assistance with when it comes to um designing laws or, you know, re reaching the, the necessary, necessary criteria for the uh, European accession or, or NATO, because they also have this, you know, political track when it comes to rule of law and, and other things. Uh, well, now as the war is ongoing here in Ukraine, of course, it has impact on the, on the entire region and perhaps on the whole world uh, to, to a certain point. What, um, what challenges and what threats did uh, your country face in connection with this full-scale uh, full scale Russian offensive? And what is the current security situation in, in Lithuania and, and the entire Baltic region? Well, I think that you know, we, we, we are part of a global community when it comes to uh, uh, energy prices, food prices, uh, everything that is uh, happening uh, with you know with as part of putin's war in in ukraine is also a, a part of putin's war against uh, against the global community so um 
So there are these issues, you know, that we, that we are facing. It's, uh, it, it's a challenge, but we're still hoping that with enough European solidarity, we can overcome them. But obviously, the, one of the biggest challenges is geopolitical one. You know, for 30 years, Lithuania was one of those countries saying that Russia is a threat, that it's an aggressive imperialistic power with an intention to, uh, with no good intentions to its neighbors, <laughs> so to say. Um, so we've, you know, we've, we can say that we've been right, uh, but that doesn't, these words does not make us safer. Uh, so we are very much keen on um, helping Ukraine win <laughs> because it, it makes us more secure uh, and also, you know, secures, secures the whole region. But uh, in the meantime, also making sure, uh, uh, also making sure that we can, prevent any any escalation i mean to you know to to more countries so that's why uh you know in madrid where many countries nato countries pledged nato pledged support to ukraine but also pledged support to uh countries in the baltics in the eastern flank that they will be defended as well so i would say that this is probably what one of the things that we are looking into well since uh, now that uh, sweden and finland uh, are on their final stretch uh, to NATO. Have your contacts with these two nations expanded? I mean, do you feel more secure in the region uh, knowing that these two countries are about to become part of the alliance? It's, it's a very strong message and it's a very, uh, you know, it's, it's, NATO is getting stronger. Uh, through through these through these decisions, Baltic region is getting stronger. Um, I would definitely like to see uh, Finland and Sweden get becoming members faster, because I think that uh, you know staying in this um, uh, not yet in situation is is not safe for anybody. It's uh, so I think that it's I would definitely like to see them you know in. Uh, but with what we're seeing happening in the Baltic Sea itself, and I'm talking about the recent sabotage of uh, Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, um, it makes you think whether the Baltic region is actually uh, safer. So I think that we're still in the escalatory stage. Uh, so, so to say that we have to be prepared, uh, prepared for for. for more eventualities and and therefore in order to compensate for them we need to make sure that we invest in our in our safety as well together with our allies here in in the baltic region so i say that this is an important step but it's not yet it doesn't solve all the issues that we're currently facing well speaking about eventualities and the recent incidents uh the gas as uh, the gas pipelines uh do you believe that your your country's energy infrastructure may be targeted in some kind of a hybrid attack, not direct militarily, but you know, no one knows who did that, but it happened. Are you considering this possibility? It definitely makes you think uh, that there is an actor in the Baltic Sea with in intent and capacity to attack infrastructure. And there's a lot of infrastructure in and around the Baltic Sea. So definitely, I think it has to be um, thought through, and uh, at this stage, all the countries are doing that on mostly on their own, uh, seeing what we can do in order to make our inf infrastructure more secure. But I think it has to be approached also through um, multinational uh, formats such as NATO, uh, because it's it's a, a real issue. The, the sea itself is a is a not very large one. <laughs> that means that any activity here affects everybody equally, even though it, it might have happened near uh, Danish borders, territorial waters, or Swedish. Uh, but, you know, Lithuania is just, Lithuanian territorial waters are just a few hundred kilometers away. So it definitely affects uh, all of our security, and it has to be uh, seen as a, as a common, uh, common area for um, need for increased security. Yeah, that's speaking about climate as well, of course. Environmental security too, probably. Right? Exactly, and environment as well. Uh, another sphere of security, information, the media space. Um, we've known that Lithuania has been 
among champions to eradicate Russian propaganda in your country, right? Uh, what is the current situation in your information space? How did the uh, recent arrival of some Russian and probably Belarusian journalists to your country uh, as a new host for their uh, programs uh, um, influence this space? And to what extent at this moment has the influence of Kremlin propaganda maybe remained in place in some areas? Uh, I would say that uh, when it comes to Kremlin uh, propaganda, we managed to make some steps, necessary steps from the mm, from the political standpoint. That means that decisions were made to limiting uh, the TV channels, for example, who were actively uh promoting uh, war in ukraine and all the you know other propaganda nonsense uh so that was done but also i would say that um other people in the country have already um uh, evolved a certain level of um knowledge and understanding of how to deal with with propaganda when it's in social media or how how to be, be certain what is what is true or what is not. We've been in this situation for a very long time, and and we've been no we knew the situation that we are in too. So we're new not new in this game, and uh, so I would say that there is a uh, there is a level of certainty that uh, we're doing we're doing all, all right at this point. Uh, the arrival of Belarusian and Russian opposition and uh, journalists here to Lithuania, I think I can only say that it has been a positive impact uh, because many of them are you know, professionals, in, professionals in their field. Uh, that means that they are providing not just Lithuanians, but you know, a much broader community with objective information as much as it is possible to get out that information from from Russia or Belarus and to, to spread it through you know through independent uh, independent channels, so it is it is useful and it's it is helpful. Um, so we are keen on continuing cooperation with with those who who arrived and helping them, uh, not just to stay here, but those who are still seeking for ways out, helping them to to get out of of, of Russian Belarus. Well, yes, of course, uh, apart from those people who are fleeing Russia and Belarus today, uh, your country has uh, welcomed lo you know, lots and lots of Ukrainians who fled the war. And uh, we're really thankful for that. Uh, but we also heard that uh, Lithuania is participating in the restoration of some infrastructure in Ukraine, probably in Kiev and Sumer regions. What are Lithuania's plans in this regard? Well, the, the, the bottom line is that we are still looking for what is called, you know, a, a European or global initiative. Uh, because when we're talking about the restoration of Ukraine, it's not news to you, but it's a huge country. You know, you compare to Lithuania, it's an enormous country. So uh, any country's single effort is, uh, in most cases, it's a show of goodwill. But if we're keen on restoring roads, bridges, uh, hospitals, schools, you know, the whole infrastructure that is still being destroyed, actually, as, as we speak, you know, we need a concerted effort, you know, like a Marshall Plan that was established in, in Europe after the war. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a Marshall Plan for, for Ukraine. Um, so that's, that's a bottom line. But despite the fact, while we're waiting, we will do our part to the best of our ability. So the, the we have a budget for next year that would be, that will be dedicated. Uh, it's being actually discussed now, uh, where the, the parliament will be presented the the, the budget next week. Uh, so we'll be discussing that. But it will have money allocated just for building certain objects. It could be schools, it could be uh, other other social or, or cultural um, objects um, in in Ukraine that we agree with with Ukrainian authorities that this is this is what is needed this is what we can do and uh, we'll we'll start working on that um, i would say next year i see thank you um speaking of costs uh, speaking of costs the winter is coming and it will be really hard here in ukraine of course uh, we are aware of russia's plans to hit our 
energy infrastructure, our critical infrastructure. But we also understand that winter might be hard for many, many Europeans uh, due to Russia's energy blackmail. Uh, I know that Lithuania was one of the first ones to consider uh, looking into alternative gas, right? It was the terminals for LNG and uh, so on. How do you think the West, let's say Europe, uh, how, do you, how do you think Europe is prepared to live through this winter? Will it prevail? Will it stand uh, up to its, um, to its current stance? after the colds kick in? I think that we are, Europe as, as, as a union, we are prepared as best as we could prepare through this you know, short, short period of time. Um, and yes, we're paying a, a big price for that, uh, but we're paying also for decades of building on dependence on Russia. Uh, we overlooked uh, what is called a national security margin in this, and now we have to pay you know, it with dividends for all the decades that we overlooked it. So this is, this is what's happening. And so nobody should be extremely surprised uh, that it has to be done. And um, the diversification from Russian energy sources is happening extremely fast. Uh, and I hope, my hope is that the best case scenario would be that we just need to live through one uh, winter. That is probably would be not, not very cold, but would be very expensive. Uh, but we have to keep in mind that if we're, uh, if we keep the solidarity alive, that could be the last, uh, winter that is that expensive. Second thing we need to keep in mind that Ukrainians currently will not have an expensive winter, but in many cases, just a very cold one. So where I think that we should not be uh, complaining that much, but showing solidarity to those who are fighting for their sovereignty. Well, that's not uh, energy is probably not the uh, not the only one, uh, not the only threat that Russia is posing, and not the only blackmail Russia is putting forward. We have nuclear blackmail, right? It's very yeah. urgent now, and it's being looked into very seriously by all our partners, and of course in Ukraine as well. Um, there's there's saber uh, saber rattling. Uh, we've known that, but we still take it seriously. But what do you think um, should be the uh, way of collective deterrence needed to stop Putin maybe in his tracks as he actually looks into employing such deadly weapons? Oh, I think that the, uh, the messages and the wording that was used by, by NATO and some of our allies within NATO is the right one. Uh, it's, first of all, we cannot let Putin to blackmail us in any case, be it with nuclear, be it with uh, uh, Zaporizhia, be it with uh, food uh, or, or energy. Uh, the answer has always to be firm. And this is, this is incredibly important. And um, I think that uh, the exact phrase was that in case Putin decides something uh, something really um, out of, you know, that, that would show that he's, he's out of his, uh, uh, any mind, that the answer would be crippling. And I think that we should stick to this and uh, not necessarily go into more details. I don't think that is needed, but to show resolve that the answer would be crippling. I see. I see you all talking about conventional weapons. Given the latest uh, gains that Ukraine army has in the south and uh, in the east of Ukraine, uh, has the perception in the West somewhat changed of what Ukraine might need on the battlefield to successfully oust Russia from Ukraine? Is there any readiness to supply maybe some other types of serious equipment, say main battle tanks, aircraft, 
more air defense systems uh, uh, in the wake of uh, attacks on critical infrastructure, or maybe new types of munitions for the already supplied platforms. Are you aware of any of those talks? Well, we've been always advocating in Lithuania through all the levels possible that uh, Ukraine needs everything that we can, I mean, that we have, so to say, so that not giving a level of difference, like, you know, and then arguments, different arguments that, okay, we're giving you just a, just a javelins and stingers and then maybe something else and maybe something else. It was clear that uh, Ukrainian army is able, capable to use uh, NATO grade weaponry uh, for di different levels and successfully use it to, to uh, conquer back uh, the occupied territories. Now where we are is that I think that the arguments that were used before are lost, you know, because, you know, some of our allies would argue that, oh, this is, you know, this is too technologically advanced, uh, you know, to, to teach and train uh, Ukrainian soldiers. Uh, maybe even, you know, we've heard some arguments that uh, it could be lost or destroyed or something like that. It is clear that all those arguments are no longer valid. So if they're not longer valid, I don't see a reason why Ukraine should not be provided with everything that we have. And I've, I've said that before, and I can repeat it now, that all of our stocks need to be opened to Ukrainian army. And if this training is needed, you know, now we have platforms for that as well. People are being trained in, in, in many countries. As far as I understand, uh, it was mentioned by, by Joseph Borrell that every country now participates on different degrees, but participates, European country participates in training of Ukrainian uh, soldiers. So I don't see any arguments. And if there, if there are still debates ongoing, this is unfortunate because the longer the debate drags, you know, the, 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 the more, uh, the longer the war drags. Well, I hope uh, your counterparts, your colleagues across the EU and across the Atlantic will be as resolute as you are in this regard. <laughs> <laughs> really yes, so. well, we're, you know, we're keen on providing political arguments for that. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, uh, huge stocks of our own. Well, to wrap this up, uh, please convey our best wishes to the deeply respected Vitatos Lansbergis, uh, wishing good health. You know, we had issues uh, recently. Uh, what is the, a little personal question, right? What does the example set by such an outstanding grandfather mean to you? Well, um, you know, when, when I started as, as a politician almost a, a decade ago, I've, uh, uh, I kind of considered that the historic times are over. And, uh, you know, Lithuania had its moment in history when we reclaimed our independence. And now we're in this post-historic uh, uh, stage. So now it's clear that it, I was wrong, uh, Fukuyama was wrong, everybody was wrong, uh, that history is continuing, and, and Lithuanian history is continuing as well. Uh, but that uh, raises the level of responsibility for everyone who's participating now. So I would say there are many people of those, not just me, who would um, try and think more deeply as to what kind of decisions, what kind of stance, people like my grandfather and others like him uh, in 1990s had to make. How did they uh, present themselves? How did they see Lithuania? How did they see their responsibility and Lithuanian responsibility in 1990s? And probably we need to learn from them and, and, and apply uh, those lessons of, of theirs to, to these times so that we can, uh, we can make sure we are doing the right thing. In these, in these truly historic times. Well, thank you, Minister. Thanks again for being with us today and good luck in all your endeavors. Thank you so much. Thank you for the questions. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Bye.